truth be known, farmers and ranchers have been working on sustainability from the beginning. People in America would be unbelievably surprised if they knew that farmers and ranchers were blazing a trail when it comes to renewable energies. We are making investments in our land and our farms at the same time that we're keeping everybody's pantry full of food. Our farmers and ranchers across this country not only provide food and fiber for our people of our country and the rest of the world, they also lead the way in conservation practices. We not only conserve our soils and water, we also provide unbelievable habitat for wildlife around our farms and ranches. It's important to us to keep that up to make sure that we can pass our farms on to the next generation in better shape than we found them. Well, thank you to the American Farm Bureau Federation for their generous support of our summit. We really appreciate it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know we've got a full house here today. If you're not interested in sitting in the very front row, there is uh, seating up in the balcony. You're welcome to go to the second floor and join us there as well. Um, I'm really excited for this next panel, although I have to say, I, weren't the young pro producers just terrific? They, they really did a good job. And this panel is gonna do a great job too. Uh, today we've got Joe Outlaw, who is a Regents Fellow and professor, professor and Extension Economist at Texas A&M University. Uh, John Newton, Chief Economist of the U.S. Senate Ag Committee for the Republican Minority Staff. Also joined by Gary Madison, who is a Senior Vice President of Beginning Farming, Farmer Programs and Outreach for the Farm Credit Council. And Audra Kapasinkas, the Principal at SG2 S2G Ventures, and uh, just delighted to have all of you here with us today as we begin this conversation. And the title is uh, broad enough to incorporate a lot of different discussions around money, uh, and it's called Show Me the Money, uh, Show Me the Numbers, so that we can be thinking about what's really possible from not only the federal level, but also what is possible from some of the venture capital that's flowing into agriculture around this innovation space. So um, in preparation for this, and, and Joe, you and I have been on the circuit here a little bit this spring, <laughs> seeing each other, and I know you were talking about all the history you've had with farm bills. I went back to think of the first farm bill I worked on was 1981 and covering that. Uh, not exactly something that I would recommend in terms of great federal farm policy. Uh, you know, it was during the Reagan administration. We had David Stockman, so we had a lot of different things going on then. But if you think about it, it was also a time where interest rates were starting to increase. There was a lot of concern about the federal deficit. Um, some themes that are very similar to what we're seeing today. And so as we, as we go forward, I'm also re reminded of the fact that, you know, that bill in 81, we were talking about under $100 billion in spending. And now we're getting ready to, you know, do a 2023 farm bill. And 2018 turned out to be over a trillion in spending. So things have really changed in terms of the numbers that are involved in investing in agriculture. So um, one of the things that Joe works on is having the ability to look at farms all around the country, 94, I think, representative farms in over 30 states. And Joe has talked about the fact that over the last few years, because of the pandemic, and then we had the tariffs and uh, you know a lot of different funding that was coming out of Washington, D.C., uh, there's a lot of money in farm country right now. Um, it's not perhaps going to be there in the future. So what do you see from the farms that you're talking to, those representative farms? Give us kind of the lay of the land of how farmers and ranchers are doing that you're talking to. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I, our, our farms, our representative farms at the Ag and Food Policy Center, for those of you who don't know, we've been doing kind of behind the scenes analysis for Congress and their staff for 40 years. This is our 40th anniversary of doing this. And so we've been working with representative farms for that time. And, and so I've learned a lot about how they're handling things from the 700 people that we actually uh, work with in that process. 
And, and one of the things that has been very clear is that there has been an accumulation of cash payments through ad hoc, through various means that you mentioned. And so the financial si situations are very strong right now. I think our lender is going to tell us that in a minute. But one of the things that's interesting is we take and, and look at what is the forecast for the next, and actually we're about to put out a publication that, that talks about the time during this farm bill. So starting now through when this farm bill will end, and, and for the first time in a long time, our, our outlook is very strong for the feed grains, and, and I would say this is the best wheat outlook we've ever had in 40 years, uh, with only uh, one farm not in really good category. Uh, we categorize the farms uh, across different financial measures. And the ones, the, the set of farms that are not as good are, are cotton farms, about half of them look to be in good shape, and only about a fourth of our, our rice farms. And on the, the livestock side, it's 50-50 in terms of the, the, the producers that look like they're going to fare this time during the farm bill process uh, and come out the other end in good shape. Well, that's, uh, that's great news, and especially for the, the wheat growers that, uh, that you're talking to. It's been a while for, for some of them. Um, let's turn it over to John Newton for just a little bit. I know, John, you've got a couple of slides to share as well. From the federal funding standpoint, talk to us a little bit about what you see as available funds as we're sitting here looking at a 2023 Farm Bill. Thank you, thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Let's see if I can get this clicker going. There we go. Uh, so we've been having Farm Bill hearings uh, for a while now. We had one uh, last year in, at Michigan State University. We also had another one in Jonesboro. Uh, and here in the 118th, we've had uh, you know, a number of hearings and listening sessions. Uh, and at the listening session that we had in Monticello, a, a farmer stood up in the room and said, this is going to be the most expensive crop uh, that he's ever planted. Uh, farm production expenses this year are projected at $460 billion. That's up from $442 billion last year. So with farmers across the country taking out a lot of capital to put a crop in the ground or care for livestock, uh, there's a lot of concern that the farm safety net, quite frankly, is not uh, working well enough, is not robust enough, does not reflect the realities today. And just as an example, these are Congressional Budget Office price projections for corn, soy, and wheat, the percentage price decline that we're expected to see over the next few years. Corn prices are projected to fall by 30 percent. I believe soybean prices are projected to fall by over 20 percent, and wheat prices are also uh, expected to fall immediately. So commodity prices uh, for the crop that folks have already started planting now, we're already projecting for prices to drop pretty significantly. Uh, and it's not going to trigger the farm safety nets that we have today. T Title I programs are, are not going to trigger uh, for these price declines that we're experiencing. Uh, and when you look back since 2018, we've had $93 billion in ad hoc support uh, to agriculture. 70% uh, of that came from outside the farm bill. So we know that we need to boost the safety net, uh, make it uh, more reliable. We cannot rely on ad hoc support that comes uh, two years after a natural disaster. So that's really been our emphasis for this farm bill is how do we find the resources that producers need uh, to manage the risks of agriculture today. And that reflects the, the production environment and the cost environment that we're in. Uh, and this is just an example of how far prices have to fall today to trigger the safety net for corn, soy, wheat, a variety of commodities. We're talking about a corn price that has to fall by nearly 50% before you trigger uh, PLC program payments. Soybean prices uh, in a very similar situation have to fall pretty dramatically and again, when folks are spending so much money to put a crop in the ground, uh, to not see a safety net that's reflecting that reality is something that I think we want to address and is a big priority for ours in the Farm Bill. Uh, the challenge, however, is going to be how much this Farm Bill costs. Uh, when you look at the most recent February estimate, the Congressional Budget Office had this Farm Bill at $1.5 trillion. And to put that into perspective, the last Farm Bill that we did was $867 billion at enactment. So we've seen a huge jump in nutrition spending. Nutrition spending is up about 80%. Farm bill spending overall is up over 60%, a 20% increase in crop insurance outlays. Uh, so that's going to be the, the financial environment that we find ourselves in is, A, this is the first trillion dollar farm bill that we're ever going to do, uh, and B, how do we find the resources that we need to do to address all the various issues 
in agriculture, whether it's shoring up the safety net, shoring up crop insurance, uh, ag research is a, is a big deal. Trade, we're going to have a record large negative trade balance this year, uh, negative $15 billion. So how do we boost funding for MAP and FMD programs? Uh, how do we address things like the bird flu? This is the worst bird flu outbreak we've ever seen. So we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. We know we need additional financial resources. Uh, but again, with a farm bill over $1.5 trillion, uh, that's going to be the dynamic that we have to deal with. But we do know there are additional resources out there. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act authorized about $40 billion in additional funding for agriculture. There was uh, $5 billion in forestry, close to $18 billion in conservation, and another $13 billion in rural development. Uh, so I believe there will be an effort to try to bring some of these resources over into the Farm Bill, uh, whether it's to work on conservation-related initiatives our other priorities, uh, those will be resources that we will try to use uh, in a bipartisan way for this next farm bill. Uh, Senator Bozeman wants to get to 90 votes, uh, so we know we're going to have a very, very bipartisan farm bill in the Senate. He often says you could have a resolution that says, I support Mother's Day, and you probably wouldn't get more than 90 votes. So uh, we've got our work cut out for us this farm bill, but again, the budget environment is going to make it challenging. Well, thank you, John. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more questions about where that money can come from and how it can be allocated. But Gary, um, share some of your perspective, because you do work with a lot of beginning farmers, and I think you actually work with a lot of entrepreneurs that you find out in rural America. So tell us what you're seeing from your standpoint of talking to all these younger and beginning farmers. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. So, boy, thanks for all that good news, John. Uh... Joe had the good news. <laughs> Uh, my job's focused on the good news because I'm, I'm uh, as Sarah said, looking to the future. Um, what are the beginning farmers that are out there now need? And I've got to say, I, I kind of, maybe it's where I came from. Um, I was a commercial cut flower grower for 30 years with a small herd of beef cattle. Not exactly your typical farming operation. I would not show up in any of your statistics. And most beginning farmers don't. Most beginning farmers are not corn and soybean growers, right? If you start going through the, the whole per, uh, parameters of what the possible, there we are. Oop, one ahead. Looking for my map. You Wait. magicians back there have my map up? <laughs> Looks like they're working on getting oh. the next slide advanced. All right, for you. so the best slide isn't there. Sorry about that. There it is. Okay, so I don't know if you can read the legend out there. The green means more beginning farmers. The legend at the bottom says if it's dark green, it's 300 or more beginning farmers um, in that county, and there are 493 counties that have more than 300 farmer, beginning farmers in it. Beginning farmer being someone who has been in a management position for 10 years or fewer. So, wow, great, great job out there, beginning farmers. There's lots of green up there. Um, what the heck are they doing? And you could look at that and say, well, you know, I, I can see all those ones in Texas. They have all got cattle, and the ones in Iowa have corn. And yes, there would be a higher concentration of that. But if you look further, you can see a whole bunch of, of beginning farmers in counties that are surrounding metro areas. Pretty sure they're not growing corn. Um, what are they doing? They're doing a very different kind of agriculture that is much more entrepreneurial, much more retail focused. And as you heard from the beginning farmer panel here, I hope you weren't surprised, they are a mission-based group of young farmers, right? They're in it for the life. They're, it's a sense of mission, whether it's growing food for people or raising their, their family on a farm, it's about a sense of mission. That's what's driving beginning farmers. Uh, especially the most who are entering agriculture. All right, let's try this and go to the next slide, which is just as a little background, you're going to see uh, the number of contestants. What I've done is taken from my experience of judging the American Farm Bureau Achievement Award for the past more than 10 years, um, I kept my own statistics on the side because I wanted to count how many of those folks are in different kinds of businesses. We'll get to the right slide yet, that one. Um, that the rural entrepreneurs that, are, that make up those folks who are beginning farmers, if we take this chart over time, there are about 30 contestants um, for this contest every year. I'm judging them at the national level. They've already gone through quite a few hurdles to get 
chosen as their state's Outstanding Young Farmer or Achievement Award winner. Um, about 48% of those, you can see in the orange bars, about 48% have a rural component to their farm business. These are corn and soybean growers. These are big cattle ranchers, thousands of acres. It's not what you'd expect. That's my point. What we're seeing beginning farmers do, what I'm seeing beginning farmers do, is engage in the rural economy that they are in and finding opportunities that are outside of just what's in their silo. Um, uh, you'll also note that the, the uh, longer bars re represent other businesses. 80% um, on average, 80% of the farmers that are in 30 a year times 10 years um, have another outside business. These folks are doing things, and those are not necessarily farm-related businesses. Could be anything from uh, milling grain to uh, uh, doing land leveling. All right, so where's the money come from? We'll finally get to some, some money here. Um, sorry, I'm moving around on your slides for you, or they're moving them for me, and this is just fake, this, uh, <laughs> this clicker. That's what I think. So over the past three years, Farm Credit has extended credit to beginning farmers, 250,000 or so beginning farmers. Um, if you look at that, that last year, these are the last couple of years are certainly bumped up by the uh, PPP loans um, as far as the response to COVID. But I don't know if many of you remember a few years ago in his first uh, time as, as uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Vilsack said, we need 100,000 new farmers. Well, here we go. Mr. Secretary did that last year, just about. Um, looking at the total number of dollars, um, well, when we get there, there we go. Uh, the total number of dollars is rather staggering, if you think about it, because again, not all of this, in fact, not most of it, is going to just commodity-style agriculture. It's being distributed fairly evenly um, okay, so more dollars to bigger farms. Yeah, I get that. But evenly as far as sectors. So 25% of the loans that Farm Credit made last year to beginning farm, or last year being 2021. We don't have 22's figures in yet. 25% um, uh, of the loans made were to a beginning farmer, representing about 18% of, value, of volume. There's a lot of activity there by beginning farmers. People are entering into farming in their own way, and it's focused on their, their sense of mission and the communities that they do that in. Our job as those in agriculture is possibly to capture the entrepreneurs before they go somewhere else. Look at our sense of what ag policy should be doing and change the lens to capturing people who have entrepreneurship skills and encouraging them to have an ag business also. Thank you, Gary. Um, I, and I want to hold that thought, too, about capturing entrepreneurs, because I think it really is putting this whole discussion into a different, with a different lens. Um, so we'll come back to that. Audrey, uh, the last time I saw you, you were at the Western Growers Meeting for a Shark Tank competition. Yeah. And the winner of that competition received a $6 million equity investment, and it was called Nut Jobs. Great name. Yeah. <laughs> and just a really fascinating story about, again, entrepreneurs who were taking nut hole waste and turning it into a biodegradable replacement for plastic. So I, I just want to say that to set the stage because she has probably the best job of anybody on this panel. She gets to invest in new startups and, and uh, really sees things, again, through a different lens of what's happening in investments in agriculture. So I'd like you to share a few of the facts and numbers with with our grout. Yeah, thank you so much. And Sarah, thanks for having me and thanks to the panelists for tolerating me being here. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I work for a venture fund called S2G Ventures. Um, we are one of the largest agri-food venture investors in the space. We manage about $2 billion and we have about 90 companies in our portfolio. And the companies we invest in, Gary, I loved your comments. I feel like you're working with the folks that are in the industry and doing the hard work. 
a lot of the companies that we're investing in are at the cutting edge at the frontier of emerging technologies. So very often these are high risk businesses. These are businesses that are taking technology out of university systems and spinning them out and really thinking about reimagining how we approach industry and how we do things better. And so when, um, when we were prepping for this panel, I thought it would be helpful to share a little bit about what we're seeing in the space and just the, the, the growth in the, in the sector because I do think that this tells a really interesting story. So basically the takeaway is over the last 10 years, we've seen a 10x increase in the volume of capital being deployed in ag tech uh, solutions. Um, we've seen a tremendous growth in the number of businesses that are in the space, also around 10x. Um, and if you put this in the context of the farm bill, the real takeaway here is five years ago when the last farm bill was written, a lot of these solutions were not ready to be commercialized broadly. A lot of these technologies were not ready to be uh, talked about in a forum like this. And a great example is RNA and the, the progress that we've made with really rapidly commercializing RNA-based solutions because of COVID um, and the situation that we ended up in. So if you take that as one use case and one example and you put it in the context of this, there's actually, John, your slides were, you know, pretty, pretty tough. Um, but when I, when I look at my space and... Um, I'm with Gary, I'm more of an optimist with all of this. I think that there's a ton of potential and I think we need to create a system that uh, creates more flexibility and really incentivizes the adoption of some of these new innovations because there is just a lot on the horizon in terms of developments and how we could think about future-proofing this industry. Um, and one thing that we talked about, Sarah, on the prep call was, okay, well, what areas are getting funding and um, where do we see a lot of opportunity? Internally, we talk a lot about how we're entering into the golden age of biology. Um, you know, we were down at um, U of I at their Genomics Research Institute. There's a ton of great work happening there. Um, and you see that in terms of the in investment figures that are pouring into the space, whether it's things like green fertilizers, um, different crop protection approaches. Um, you see this in different financial models and ways to manage risk and risk management. Um, as you have more digital solutions being deployed, there's more data that's being developed around farmer practices, how they approach things. Um, it provides us with an opportunity to use that data and provide more actionable insights on how a farmer might take action given a particular situation. It might give folks like Gary more information with which to differentiate loans and provide a lower cast of cost of capital for certain players. And then if you continue to go right here, um, you have a number of advances in precision ag. So there was a recent USDA study that was published um, and there are about, I think there's a 30% penetration rate um, around precision ag uh, in the US right now. That's low, we think there's an opportunity to go higher. But the point is there's a lot of money flowing into the space and a lot of interest, frankly, in people who are experts from other industries wanting to have a line of work that is purpose-driven and really tied into something that matters. And our food system matters, it matters to everybody. And so, you know, from a talent perspective, <clears throat> well, so why is this happening? I guess that's the first question. I think on the technology side, there's a ton of advancements happening. So you look at a sensor as a proxy. The cost of a sensor has gone down 100x in the last 10 years, and the resolution has gone up 100x. So when you think about that and you think about all these precision technologies getting better, they're not getting better just because a bunch of venture capitalists are in the room. They're getting better because there's a lot of scientists and technologists and universities really working on improving the efficacy of these tools and being able to provide them at scale and at a cost that is more economically viable than it was in the past. And from a talent perspective, we also see a number of folks that are coming from places like Google and Meta who want to put um, you know, their skill sets to work in a space that they care about. And so um, again, at our venture fund, we have about 90 portfolio companies 
every week we, we have a ton of people who reach out to us saying, listen, I want to get into this space or I'm looking to apply my skill set. So like we've made some investments in businesses where, um, you know, it's really a technology play and they're working very closely with industry. Um, but you're taking some of the best minds that have spent 20 years building data science models and various algorithms and they're applying it to the space, which we find really exciting. So, um, you know, areas that we're particularly excited about, given the technology and given the talent that is focused on those areas. Um, robotics, um, so we work very closely. Sarah, you mentioned the work we do with Western Growers Association. Um, they have a whole automation initiative. They've been ve working very closely with industry, with their grower networks, and with investors like us. Um, and robotics is making a lot of progress. We think that in the next five years, that is really going to have a huge impact on particularly the specialty um, produce industry, but you know, obviously row crop has a lot um, to benefit there as well. Digitization and data, we think that this is a huge unlock, um, not only because it could help make, it, it could help growers make better decisions, um, but we also see this um, having an impact on uh, the last bit there, which is, um, just different ways to think about risk management and to think about providing various tools to growers uh, to run their businesses better. And then alternative crop inputs. Um, you know, on the last panel, um, there were several mentions of sustainability. For us, it's really about having productive farms and increasing profitability for the grower. Um, the last year saw a huge spike in fertilizer prices, and it's really interesting to see what happened in the market. Um, it, based on some research that we saw recently, 30% of large farms are trialing green fertilizers as a result of the, the high fertilizer prices that we saw last year. And this is a great example where emerging technologies like sound agriculture can come in, they could reduce the need for fertilizer by 50%, and you could still then bring in other tools that provide warranties so that if you do see a yield drag, those costs would be covered. So that's an example of the market has forced growers to make some really hard decisions, but there is technology that's being developed and made broadly available commercially that I think is leading to better outcomes and enabling um, stronger grower profitability. Um, so that's a little bit of our perspective. Um, we think that the farm bill and policy has a huge role to play in de-risking this space. Um, private investors are very interested in the space. We're going to continue acting in it, um, but things like, you know, providing flexible programs so that you have the opportunity to have things like pilots and trials. Um, as Mitch mentioned, having programs that allow for growers to test out different innovations. We think that that is really important um, and that's a big reason why I'm here today. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Um, you mentioned data and the importance of that. Joe, you're collecting this information on these representative farms. Uh, we know that we have data that's being collected by USDA, but it, is any of it robust enough to really drill down and say these practices convert to these outcomes? Are, are we accessing that type of data? I can't speak to what USDA is using their data for, but I know that on our panels we can we can look and see which sets of practices are the most efficient. We do that kind of work all the time. Uh, the The reality is is that there's a lot of really important and efficient things going on on the farms. Uh, I tend to say that we work with the best of the best. We don't work with your average farmer. We work with above average farmers. Uh, it's just it's they are. I, t I say this with no disrespect to the university I was educated at, but from most of my career I've worked with these farmers and I learned way more from them than I did in the classroom. And, it, and, it's, and it's not to, not to say the classroom isn't important, but when you see when people who are, are entrepreneurs themselves who are doing things and making uh, substantial business decisions and growing their businesses, uh, it's very impressive, and those are the types of people I, like. I get drawn to, to, to see what they're doing differently. And, and frankly, it's, it's, it's a really important uh, niche because most of the, the, the producers that you work with that are still around, I mean, back when I started all this, uh, you could say there was not so good farmers, but basically you're not a, a you're not a, they used to call them a, a a cigar box farmer that would bring their records in the cigar box. That is not the way this is anymore. These people are very 
Uh, when I bring farmers into my own class, they are they put up all their financials on the overhead from from their record keeping system that they're paying to to uh, manage, and they can show on this field I made this profit, on this field I made this profit, and this is why. Uh, that's a very different world that most people don't set and think about in terms of agriculture. Uh, so yes, there are ways to use and utilize that information. People are doing it every day. Uh, I, I don't see any farmers out there that are not pushing. The one thing I will say, and it lends to John's, uh, when I said all these farms are doing well, those are projections. We all know the prices. We all know another Ukra Ukraine could happen, or on the other side, we could have the best crop we've had in a long time, and the prices are going to fall. I can't give the, the price forecast because that's our partner at FAPRI's job to do, and those numbers are out. But their forecast is coming way down, as, as John uh, said. So how did I have that those farms were going to be okay at the end of this farm bill? It's because they've accumulated a lot of cash, either through the ad hoc payments and then this year. And then starting next year, prices are going to go bad. And so you got to really watch the financial situation of these farms as we go forward. Just because they, they, they end the period okay, uh, our, our best metric for farms is they only – have a 25% chance of not cash flowing. Nobody in this room would want to have a job where they only had a 25% ch chance of not cash flowing. But in agriculture, that is a that is a measure that you can use because most of the time they don't meet it. Well, and I think you can see that in all the discussions we've had lately with different farm organizations is things look okay now. And even though net farm income is, is expected to decline, it's still expected to be above historical levels. But they can kind of see what might happen going forward. And one of the most recent letters we've reported on is that a large coalition of farm organizations said, well, we want sufficient resources in this next farm bill, John. And uh, you kind of laid out the case here for why that's going to be difficult unless we tap into some other areas. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping you can make some news today and tell me how this is going to happen. Uh, I'm not making any news, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, my boss might it later this afternoon. You know, I think the letter that we got asking for additional resources in this farm bill was, was pretty important. Uh, and it shows the, the power of agriculture. When you come together, uh, you can get a lot of amazing things done in this city. Agriculture has a very, very strong voice. And as an example of that, uh, you know, late last year when we were working on budget reconciliation, one of the proposed pay for was an elimination of stepped up basis. Uh, and agriculture came together with Main Street and said, we're not going to let that happen. As a result of ag sticking together, you didn't see that in the House Ways and Means package. And I think that applies to today. Agriculture needs to stick together uh, and help us get this farm bill over the finish line. You need to ask for what you want. This farm bill lawmakers need to hear that you need additional financial resources. Uh, to shore up the, the farm programs, to make investments in crop insurance. So again, when ag sticks together, you have a very, very powerful voice. Uh, my boss wants to make sure this farm bill is, is farmer focused and farmer driven. Uh, so we want to hear from our grassroots on what they need. But some, just to follow up on that, some of the projections of uh, just even a relatively small increase in reference prices, we're talking about billions of additional dollars. Um, so lacking um, maybe Audrey wanting to, you know, invest in a farm program, you know, where's that money going to come from? Um, do we anticipate that there, you know, might be uh, any additional funds at all, or will we just be taking from one area of the farm bill to pay for another? We certainly hope that there are additional resources in the farm bill. Uh, and you mentioned raising reference prices and the price tag associated with that. Uh, we know that there are other things that can be done. There are tweaks to the effective reference prices that you could consider. Uh, you can look at some of the shallow loss crop insurance options like SCO and ECO, uh, maybe make improvements there so the growers have the tools they need, uh, really, again, to address these unanticipated uh, ad hoc events or catastrophic natural disasters. But we know we're going to need more resources in this formula. That's important. And it goes beyond just the safety net. Gary, let's turn to you for a second and go back to your thought about capturing entrepreneurs, um, especially in this environment where interest rates are starting to increase again. Um, you've got a lot of folks that are very sensitive in their in their debt positions. Um, 
farm credit. I saw a recent letter that assured everybody that was a borrower that uh, we are not banks right now. Um, so farm credit is doing very well, thank you. But as you look at trying to bring, again, this next generation in, what are your thoughts on how do you capture that entrepreneurial spirit? Is it something that's going to require more training, or do we need to beef up our rural development programs? So there are things like the previous panel announced about you know need for childcare and broadband and, and all those things that make it livable in rural America. Can you share some thoughts on how you bring more of those folks together? Sure, and, and recognizing the, that variability of who exactly is a beginning farmer, um, makes this a much more complicated question because there's so many different needs. So the, the, uh, it's a fairly small number of farms in the country that produce most of the economic value. Um, that doesn't mean all those small farms are unimportant to that person that's running them, having been that size small farmer, right? That was my business. It was really important to me that it be successful so I could do that lifestyle that I wanted. Helping beginning farmers that are just entering into agriculture is something that we've devoted a lot of resources to, the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. But that's mostly for, um, I shouldn't say but, and it is mostly for those new entrants to farming, not so much for those who are, uh, those farmers who are in a, a larger multi-generational uh, farm family. There's a separate set of educational opportunities for those folks. Uh, TPAP um, as a program, uh, a lot of executive sort of, of programs that are fairly high level. And I think one of, the, one of the most jarring things that I found out about this whole, so how do we train and how important it is that to, to beginning farmers was at a, a farm credit beginning farmer conference several years ago where we had a panel much like you had before, Sarah, beginning farmers except it was from 4 h -er to college, recent college graduate to 35 year old, and asked, well, what do you think of farm credit? And they said, well, I think of farm credit as an education company. What the heck? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's part of, it's a lot of what farm credit does in its beginning, a young beginning small farmer programs um, that each of the farm credit associations around the country has. But to hear the beginning farmers say that to the lender, saying, well, I'm gonna count on you for education, is, is fairly jarring and then at the, in the next moment it's uh, quite a responsibility. So think about where people get information. Um, you can get a lot of bad information on the internet about how easy farming is um, and how wonderful a life it is. Um, but when it comes to putting dollars on the table, there are trusted advisors. And whether it's farm credit or cooperative extension or whomever we have, um, even venture capitalists, um, being a trusted advisor to beginning farmers helps them understand what they expect to put into their business and what they expect to get out of it. And that's, that's the essence of entrepreneurship. And um, one, thing, one thing to maybe add to that, it's interesting. So we spend a lot of time talking to industry and working with a lot of the trade associations. And several of them are actually working with local community colleges to develop programs specifically around kind of this next generation grower or farmer that's um, expected to come online, um, just given the advances in technologies and the skill sets that are necessary. So it'll be an interesting trend to watch over the next 10 years. And a question came in for you, Audrey. Um, Bruce Knight wanted to know, is it possible to track the volume of investments that's being targeted towards sustainability and maybe more broadly climate smart? Do you folks keep track of that at all? We do, um, and I apologize, I don't have that number off the top of my head, but um, yeah, broadly, I mean, what we've seen in the space is, um, so you have quite a few, you know, well, you have a number of investors that are committed to the space and very, very specific. So like us, we're dedicated to food and agriculture. Um, you have a number of other larger investors. Um, you know, you see this like Wellington spinning up a climate fund. Um, I saw them last week at World Agritech and they have really large checks that they're looking to deploy. And so it is interesting seeing these um, climate investors come in or investors with an ESG mandate because oftentimes they are coming in um, with the ability to write larger checks, which our industry really needs, frankly. Like we talk a lot about the Series C, Series D clip 
if, where sure, you've got a bunch of investors who could come in and do a Series A um, and write a million dollar check or a five million dollar check, but to make these solutions really scalable and available across the country, you, I mean, this is a physical industry, it's really hard, this isn't a switch that you just flip and the technology works. Um, and so you do need these larger checks to come in. So um, I can follow up and share the numbers in terms of actual number of deals and number of investors, but there's, there's quite a few in the space. And I think for us, we want them to come into agriculture because frankly, if we want to be more innovative, we need more capital that's focused on innovation to come into the space. I think we need to educate them though about what would be helpful for the farmer. Sure, Gary. So, so if you... And uh, those investors as the rock star, the farm credits and commercial bankers are the roadies, right? We get everything set up, we make sure that, that things work, um, we're there all the time, and then the rock stars come and they do, woohoo, we got That's it. giving us too much credit, Gary. But, oh, take it, take it, it's okay. <laughs> so what, what we need... <laughs> this is a you, 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 were, you were running the slides, weren't you? You were that guy. <laughs> okay, how about yours, John? Oh, yeah, I, we did not decline his loan. How about this one? There we go. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Um, so, rock stars, roadies, the investment in conservation agriculture, climate smart agriculture, all that, that, that is being massively funded now, happens day to day by current ag lenders. It's just in small pieces. It's not the, um, it, it is the innovation that an individual farmer applies to their own operation based on their balance sheet, based on their mission sense, based on their perception of the future. And, and that happens every day. Where the, where, what is needed that we're trying to do within farm credit is find a way to get the venture capital to be able to apply through or with us ag lenders. It's kind of that last mile problem for broadband all over again. You know, the, the dollar has to travel that last mile to the farmer through a trusted advisor to, to say, you know, it's probably okay or, you, you know, this isn't going to ruin you financially to be able to make this large investment based on the trusted advisor and that roadie that's doing the basic blocking and tackling every day, every year um, for the financial um, health of that farm into the future. Because in the end, that's what a lender is most interested in is that financial health. I was going to say how you're paying the loan back, but that's the shorthand version. <laughs> this is, so I mentioned um, interest rates. And we, of course, don't know exactly where they're going to end up. Uh, but in talking to a fairly large, very progressive farmer a couple of weeks ago, he was saying, you know, I think I'm just going to sit 2023 out in terms of new investments because I just don't know. There's just so much uncertainty. And I'm wondering if our panelists, any of you can pitch in here on this. Are you starting to see that chilling effect ripple down where <clears throat> people are just saying, well, maybe not, not time to buy the new tractor, not time to... Um, we know farmland sales are still going on at a very high rate, but it is, is that starting to hamper purchases? I have anecdotal information that would say that there are a number of producers that are delaying replacement on, on expensive equipment to see where interest rates are going to go. Hopefully, hopefully they, they, they start retracing, but for most of you, I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk about both sides of my mouth too much as an economist, but uh, the reality is there's, they've had these big cash infusions, and farmers use equipment purchases for tax management. And, and so there's going to be some of that all along the way. It's just a matter of what, where, are we gonna, where are we going to... Uh, uh, many of them are really worried because the, 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 the one place that the... the high interest rates is really bothering them is their operating notes. As John mentioned earlier, and it's important, the, the cost to put in crops is so much more across the board. Not just fertilizer went up, but everything went up. And yes, yes, there's a couple of things trickling down a little bit, but they're coming off of record highs. So uh, the, they're uh, 
operating note interest is going to be substantial, which is going to eat into to, to profits. Um, a lot of people say, well, they still made money. These prices are really high. My answer is yes. And I don't want to leave here without leaving you this message. Yes, they made money, but they made so much more less money because inputs were higher last year and this year. And one of the things, if you're someone old and unfortunately gray-haired guy like myself has seen these cycles, the farmers are really mad about this situation, not because they didn't make money, they made some, but because the really good times with these high prices they had, they weren't able to make enough to offset when things get bad. And John, you pointed out that it's not equal across all commodities either in terms of who's been able to keep up and who hasn't. You You're exactly right. It's, it's, it's different. Uh, you know, whatever commodity you look at, Joe helped us do some research on rice, for example. Rice prices didn't go up as rapidly as, as corn or soybeans or wheat, yet they were paying the same fertilizer bill uh, that Joe mentioned. And so we were able in the omnibus to get about $250 million uh, to help rice producers uh, as, a, as a result of their challenging economic situation. Thank you for that. I know we've got a lot of questions that are coming in from the audience, and some of them have to do with urban farms and specialty crops, and, and how can we help those who may not be out in the broad acre areas of the country? Gary, you uh, referenced this a little bit, that those are some of where we're finding our younger and beginning farmers. Thoughts on how we might help those folks get into agriculture, get through those first few hoops and get started? Uh, that's probably where the, the training is most important, but uh, I'd, I'd turn that a little bit to experience with the Farmer Veteran Coalition. As an idea, the Farmer Veteran Coalition is there to help those returning veterans enter into the community of agriculture. If you think of that, and that's pretty easy to understand, right? I mean, there's skills from the military and you bring those to agriculture and you want to help those people who have, who have served our country. What about everybody else who's trying to enter into agriculture? It's maybe not the same, the same emotionality of that, of that mission and desire to help, but anybody who's getting into agriculture anywhere helps all of us. Um, the more people, I mean, we've complained, as a farmer, I complained for years, well, those folks in the cities just don't understand what I'm doing. Well, now they're starting to farm, for God's sakes. Let's help them do it. Um, Let's find a way to welcome them into this community of agriculture because we need, we need their support to be able to continue to do the business that Farm Credit does and to be able to have a thing called a farm bill um, that has widespread application, not just for the food side of things, but for that whole farming side of things. Thank you. Did you want to add something to that? Uh, I, sort of. I, I guess one of the things that I just wanted to mention is of the 700 farmers that we work with, again, we started 40 years ago working with some of their granddads, and now it's the dads, and they've passed it along. So about a third, a little bit more than a third of our producers that we work with are basically young farmers that are, that are taking over either through marriage, like your panel before, or, or because they were the children or the grandchildren of people that we started working with. And so when I look out on, on, in the audiences that I work with for my real job, uh, it is a lot of really young people, and they do not think the same way that their father or their grandfather thought about technology and about risk. And, and one of the things is they, they have grown up in a t time where there was relatively decent profitability, and this every time you start changing things that... They weren't alive whenever the interest rates were, were, were doing what they're doing now. And so, so you have to kind of help them through that process. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point. And, and we do see generationally, there's just a huge difference in terms of technology acceptance. And then also thinking about new growers or new approaches to particularly specialty production. Controlled environment ag was an area that has attracted a ton of venture investment. You know, I think that space is kind of rationalizing itself right now. Um, we're really focused on the picks and shovels of the industry and really thinking about how do you make it really efficient um, and profitable for the folks that are operating those businesses. Um, but I do think that there's kind of a, a combination of different modes of production and then different folks that are coming in and really just maybe being a little bit more open to different types of approaches and different products. 
So I mentioned some of the risks ahead with interest rates. And Audrey, one of the questions that's come in for you is, have we seen an impact from Silicon Valley Bank's demise in the venture capital world? I mean, it sounds like a lot of the tech investments were in that bank. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing to note here is, um, you know, getting access to capital and banking is tough. It's hard. It's hard for any entrepreneur, whether they're a grower or whether they're a tech entrepreneur. Um, and Silicon Valley Bank was a friend to technology entrepreneurs for 40 years. They often banked people that others were unwilling to bank. And so, um, you know, a lot of our portfolio companies were invested there. And the way, you know, if folks aren't involved in um, the investing landscape, so, you know, if your company raised, let's say, $30 million and you had a wire coming in, it would often land in a bank like Silicon Valley Bank, and then, you know, you would access that to pay your payroll or whatever. Um, and so, um, you know, the big concern was, will we be able to make payroll? Will we be able to cover our expenses this week? And so the weekend um, was a time where a lot of folks were just kind of looking through their books and making some contingency plans. I will say um, where we landed on Sunday night, I think provided a lot of assurances to folks. And right now I think people are, are, are feeling good. Um, we have made a recommendation to our portfolio companies that in order to manage risk, they should probably have more than one bank account. So if they just had one, they should probably diversify. Um, but we're, you know, we signed a letter with 600 other venture funds um, in support of SVB because they have been an ally to entrepreneurs for a long time. They just got caught up in, you know, shifting interest rates. Um, and so, yeah, we're kind of, I think right now in terms of investments and flows, um, the industry is back to normal relatively, um, but it was a little bit, um, there was a lot of triangulation that was going on for a little bit. That sounded like it was pretty intense. It was. Yeah. So as we near wrapping up here, uh, I'd like to give everybody a, just a chance to make a couple of closing comments. Um, and I want to start with you, Joe, in, in terms of what and I know asking this question, there are some things you can't tell us because you have top secret work that goes on at all the time. Um, but in, in general, if there's something that you think that policymakers need to remember during this time of, of developing new farm legislation, and not only for this year, but going forward, because we want to be that forward-looking uh, platform here today, uh, what What is it? Is there anything that we're forgetting to um, lift up in our conversations? Yeah, actually a few things. Uh, thank you. Uh, number one, uh, in keeping with the young theme, uh, one of the things that I hear most from younger producers is, I have access to land, I can lease land, I can get going, I can acquire land, but the land I get to farm doesn't typically have base on it. And so there's this broader base issue, reallocation issue. But I do think for a lot less money, the, the smart people to my left could figure out a way to provide us some assistance or just create base for young and beginning farmers where there wasn't before uh, for a lot less money than this allocation thing seems like it might cost, which would be a really good thing for, for people and giving them the access to the, to the Title I safety net um, and then, and then second, and this is because I've been watching this monitor this whole time, and my friend Bruce Knight keeps asking questions. Uh, what, what I want to turn back to, to the Bruce Knights of the world and to the people who are really interested in the sustainable world, uh, the, uh, there's three billion dollars going out across the country to provide uh, really smart people with ideas on how we can do more climate smart activities. But I have not seen hardly any, any investment in how are we going to handle that and keep it segregated. And that is the question I have for that audience is, is you can, I think a lot of people are going to come up with really innovative ways to be climate smart. But unless you segregate it and can prove it segregated once the, the, the food companies uh, try to handle that, I think we have, a, we have a situation where we created a really nice thing but nobody gets to use. And, and it's a different situation. So I think there are things for the committee to be asking what, what next. I don't know that they want to put resources that direction, but I know that's a what next for me. 
So, John, do you want to expound on that a little bit and also explain why the base acres discussion is often politically difficult? <laughs> it sounds like Joe wants a, a base acre update. <laughs> uh, it, it is a, a conversation that I think we need to have this farm bill. We, we've obviously heard from stakeholders uh, that would like to see a, a base acre update, but I want to back up just a little bit. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act extended conservation programs to 2031. Gave them new funding, new resources. Nutrition, mandatory spending. Crop insurance will keep going. The reason to do a farm bill and get it done on time is for the needs of production agriculture, the safety net, making investments in crop insurance, ag research, investing in trade. Joe gets a base acre update. That's the reason why we need to get a farm bill done is, is really to listen to the farmers, make sure it's farmer focused uh, and farmer driven. I, we're gonna get it done, we're gonna get it done on time but it's gonna take everybody in this room to help us get it over the finish line. Thank you. Gary, I'm gonna turn back to the similar question with Joe about what else do we need to lift up that we didn't have a chance to discuss? Well, just, just to respond to what, what Joe said about we've got this great thing for producing more climate smart agriculture products, but how can we segregate those to get a marketplace value for them? And from my conversations with some of the uh, food processors, big food companies, they're very interested in, in contracting within their grower networks. So I think that's where it will start. It's a baby step. Um, it's, it's also billions of, or hundreds of millions anyway, of dollars in terms of crop. But I think that's where it, where it starts. Innovation never happens everywhere all at once, and it's, uh, somebody's got to pick up that baton and run with it. And I think from the marketplace side, the food companies are ready because they're looking at their scope three impacts that they have to document. So, you know, sooner or later your box of Cheerios is going to have a story about the oats that are there that are, and will we in this room that know who got those climate smart commodity grants are going to be able to say, uh-huh, that's where that money went. Just, just to make sure we're on the same page, I agree with you, but until an elevator who's run by interesting people, uh, <laughs> understand that that bin only has this and that bin only has this and, and loads are coming in 24 hours a day for weeks. It only takes one load to mess this thing up if, if there's some sort of traceability here. Yeah, ask the folks about GMO corn getting in, you know, one, one load in the wrong bin. Um, but we've solved that one. So the capability is there. It's just we don't have enough silos, perhaps. We don't have the intent to do that yet. From a what's the big thing that that we haven't been talking about, and you know, my answer already got talked about is crop insurance. Making sure, because that, that kind of lays over a, many other things, and it also has the capability to touch all of agriculture. Whole farm revenue protection insurance could be made easier or be improved. Um, I think that's a, a valid goal for, for the, the technicalities from the producer side of things, and is that gonna affect a lot of people? Um, I, I think you would be surprised how Diverse large farm organizations are able to use whole farm revenue protection as a very effective tool for crop insurance. So that's the thing that, that from a farm credit standpoint, making sure that we make crop insurance work is extremely important. Thank you. Audrey, the last word is yours in terms of other things that we might want to lift up for our conversation. Yeah, great. Um, I definitely agree with the crop insurance bit. We we think that's a critical piece to this and the infrastructure build out. Um, so on, on my end, um, I would just encourage the folks in this room, I am not a policy expert, I am not an ag expert, but I talk to industry a lot and I talk to a lot of investors. Um, there's interest in the space. We just need to continue to demonstrate that this industry is open to innovation and we have programs that support the development and adoption of innovation. How do we do that? Having more flexible programs, providing access so that USDA folks have the opportunity to see what's coming up in terms of technology, and really just an openness to, to make sure that growers like Mitch, who was talking about this earlier, um, have programs that support them when they're trying out different technologies or approaches and that we don't just have these um, you know, monolithic programs that every farmer is expected to fit into. 
I think it's all about flexibility so that we could demonstrate that we are a country that's driven by innovation and open to leveraging new technologies because the pace of development is only going to accelerate. And guess what? There's money being poured in in China, in India, in Brazil into these technology advancements. So I think the private market is here. There are investors that traditionally have not invested in the space that are writing large checks that are curious, but they're not there yet. And we need to continue to demonstrate that government is here to support an innovative ecosystem and that the deep domain experts are here to support the whole industry kind of rise up. So. Well, thank you, and join me in thanking all of our panelists for a great conversation. I think you can tell this is really just the start of a much bigger conversation that I think we'll continue to have throughout the day. Um, I'd like your attention, please, for just two more minutes. We're going to show a quick video from Chevron, one of our gold sponsors. And then um, we're going to be able to take a break. So just bear with me for a couple of minutes, and then we'll all have a chance to go get some more caffeine. Always have to do with the future of trucking. At Chevron, we're working with partners to turn the methane from cow waste into the fuels of the future. Energy is everywhere, even in a little seedling, which, when turned into fuel, can help power a plane. At Chevron's El Segundo Refinery, we're looking to turn plant-based oil into renewable gasoline, jet, and diesel fuels. Our planet offers countless sources of energy, but it's only human to find the ones that could power a better future. Why would an oil and gas company look to power a truck with plant-based oil? because we believe power is all around us, and it's only human to harness it for good.